Take it from a poor Lieutenant Commander. Sometimes being number two really sucks. The early days of Starfleet and the United Earth before the Federation were some of the most challenging days of human history. Every day in the final frontier was a battle for survival, and this was no different for the crews of Earth's first Warp 5 starships. Now, as I said, we had the NX-01 Enterprise and the NX-02 Columbia. However, while the NX-01 was under the command of Captain Jonathan Archer and successfully made it to retirement, the same cannot be said for number two, the NX-02, in the command of Captain Erica Hernandez. Launched in 2154, the Columbia would play a vital role in the early engagements of Earth against interstellar forces such as the Klingons and the Romulans. She was one of the initial three NX-class starships on the drawing board, intended for deep space, long-range exploration. The mission was to take humanity to the stars. However, the NX-02's eventual mission would lead her not to the stars, but to her downfall. In this video, we'll explore the tragic fate of the NX-02 Columbia. Lieutenant, aft thrusters at one half until we clear space dock. Then take us to warp. Welcome to Trek Central, lords, ladies, and sovereigns. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam. And as always, before we warp into the video, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then make sure you hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. And of course, you can follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. And as always, please let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, because if you're talking about Star Trek, we want to hear about it. Anyway, enough pigeon voicing. Engage! So here at Trek Central, we've fully broken down the NX class of starships before, mainly with the NX-01, the Enterprise. If you want to view those, in my opinion, very well-made videos, then by all means, go ahead and take a look at them. You'll find a lot more details about technical specs of the starship within. This video will be focusing on the story and the tragic fate of the NX-02 Columbia specifically. Columbia had a somewhat troubled go of it right from the very beginning. It was under construction by at least 2153, with Captain A.G. Robinson considering himself a likely commanding officer candidate. He was, of course, passed up for captain of the NX-01 Enterprise in favor of Jonathan Archer. Robinson, however, died in 2153 during an accident on Mount McKinley. Columbia was still in dry dock and not named Columbia by the time of the Zindi attack on Earth. Admiral Maxwell Forrest and Captain Archer took a tour of the unfinished Columbia before Archer ventured into the Delphic Expanse to find the Zindi. Captain Erica Hernandez was eventually given command of the NX-02. She'd invite Archer aboard for a housewarming, shipwarming, and ask his thoughts on crew selection. Having suffered some traumatic stress during the Zindi attack on Earth and other dangerous incidents throughout the early voyages of the NX-01, however, Archer suggested the ship be more heavily armed, something the new captain rejected. In November 2154, Columbia was still stuck in dry dock with engine trouble and unable to assist her sister ship Enterprise in dealing with the mysterious Romulan drone ship. Eventually, Enterprise's chief engineer, Commander Charles Tucker III, my boy, came aboard the Columbia to help with the engine trouble and get the ship launched. While there were some teething problems with the new chief engineer, Tucker got Columbia out of dry dock and warping away. The NX-02 was finally launched officially on November 30th of 2154, marking the beginning of Earth's expansion as an interstellar power. In her early days and months of operation, Columbia would be found assisting Enterprise in her dealings with the Klingon Empire. She was pivotal in helping the Enterprise after the Klingons sabotaged the ship, and the two starships had to engage in a hazardous close-quarter maneuver at Warp 5.2. Commander Tucker eventually transferred back to Enterprise, leaving Columbia to continue operations and chart her own path forward. Now, for this next bit, we have to say a little disclaimer. <coughs> The following information is not technically Star Trek canon as it occurs in books. Books are now sorted into another timeline for Star Trek in a sense. These books and related materials take place in alternative realities from main Star Trek storylines we we'll see in the movies and the TV shows. However, the stories are fantastic and we encourage you to read the original books like the Star Trek Destiny trilogy as soon as you bloody can. 
All right? All right, crack on. Now, while it may not have surprised some, the Earth-Romulan War, or more commonly known as just the Romulan War, kicked off in 2156. It was a major interstellar conflict primarily fought between the United Earth and the Romulan Star Empire. However, it dragged in the Coalition's forces, which included Vulcan, Teleprime, and the Andorians as well. While the war would be won by the Alliance's forces and lead to the creation of the Romulan Neutral Zone, it would cost Starfleet heavily. The Columbia played a pivotal role in the war's initial days. However, she did spend the first few days being towed back to Earth by a Vulcan ship. One of her critical missions was to install an early warning system throughout Coalition territory. The same year, Columbia worked in a task force alongside Enterprise and Challenger to engage Romulan ships. The three Earth starships were reported as leaving ion trails in a nebula as they sped towards Romulan space. June 2156 would begin the downfall of the NX-02. The ship escorted a mining convoy from the Onias sector back to Earth. However, Romulan starships attacked the Columbia convoy and used some nasty technology to take control of the Columbia. They used a telecapture system, which basically is a Romulan remote desktop, and enabled them to use the Earth starship to destroy the convoy it was trying to protect. B Thankfully, the NX-02's crew were able to break free. Or rather, break the ship free. If they jumped off the ship, they would have, you know, frozen, died, and exploded, because space... Ah, forget it. That was horrible even by my standards. They faked a self-destruct sequence by detonating a torpedo while initiating a brief warp jump. However, while they escaped the destruction, the result of both this trick and the battle severely crippled Columbia. Silly sods, that kind of warp trickery only ever works against the Ferengi and only in TNG. The Columbia's warp drive and its communication system were both practically destroyed. Communications in particular was completely gutted as the Romulan telecapture destroyed both the software and firmware required to operate it. Columbia also lost her shuttles and all of her escape pods. However, the bigger loss was with the crew. Both the attack and the escape plan resulted in the ship losing half of its standing crew, including most of the Mako contingent that was aboard. And they were sitting down. No, you little Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Think you're punny, do you, you little sod? This left the ship with only 42 crew members on board, including Captain Hernandez, realizing that rescue could be months away and with no actual possibility of one happening in the first place, Captain Hernandez ordered Columbia to set a course for a nearby planet with the hope that it would pose intelligent life. Due to the critical damage of the warp drive system, the Columbia pushed her impulse engines to achieve sublight speeds. This resulted in both the ship and the crew experiencing the effects of relative time dilation. Columbia arrived on the planet in 2168. Keep in mind, they were in 2156 when they first started. However, only 63 days had passed for the crew since they implemented this plan. Upon arriving at the planet, while it looked to provide Columbia's crew with a chance to return to their old lives, it contained a dark secret. Eregol, as the planet was known, was inhabited by a highly advanced species known as the Keliar. And yes, in case you're wondering, I almost did read that as caviar, because I'm cultured. The Keliar informed the landing party that they would never be allowed to return home because the privacy of their species needed to be protected from the outside galaxy. This did not go down well with the crew. While Captain Hernandez wanted to respect the Keliar's wishes, others definitely did not. Several crew members and Mako officers even staged a mutiny against Hernandez's orders. Major Stephen Foyle, Columbia's chief engineer Carl Greylock, and weapons officer Kiona Thayer decided to hatch their plot. They wanted to force the Keriar to restore Columbia and the landing party to their own time. Major Foyle and one of his officers beamed on board Columbia, informing the transporter officer and remaining crew that the Keriar had killed the captain and the landing party. The mutiny resulted in the destruction of a Kelyar city and the disruption of the species' excellent work project, an intergalactic communications experiment. Far worse than that, though, this tragically set in motion a sequence of events that led to Eregol's star going supernova and the planet going boom. This also resulted in the creation of several extremely unstable subspace vortexes in the area. 
or vortices if you want to be picky. The NX-02 Columbia, attempting to survive the oncoming supernova, made a quick but deadly choice. Lieutenant Commander Khalil El Rashad, the acting commanding officer, took Mako officers Stephen Foyle and Vincenzo Yavcino into custody for committing mutiny on the captain. The Columbia entered the subspace tunnel, and due to the hyperphagic radiation in the tunnels, the entire crew was incinerated within 40 seconds. Columbia was ultimately listed as lost with all hands. However, the starship herself would end up in the Gamma Quadrant, where it would lay dormant for centuries. Due to the nature of Columbia's disappearance, it would become one of Starfleet's most enduring mysteries. In 2373, that mystery took the most significant twist when Captain Benjamin Sisko and the USS Defiance crew discovered the Columbia's crash site within the Gamma Quadrant an area of space the Federation and Starfleet had been slowly exploring thanks to the Bajoran wormhole at Deep Space Nine. Unfortunately, the mystery would have to wait. Captain Sisko and the Starfleet forces were forced to abandon the Columbia to time once again as Jem'Hadar ships were approaching the planet. Two months later, the Dominion War began. Due to the harsh nature of that war, Columbia's recovery was a low priority for Starfleet, However, it did mean some would speculate that the interstellar species had a role in Columbia's destruction. This would be ultimately proven incorrect. Thankfully, in 2381, and with the Dominion War long over, the Columbia crash site was visited by Esri Dax and the crew of the USS Aventine. Aventine. Aventine! <coughs> Sorry, I, I let that one get away from me a bit there. <clears throat> The Starfleet officers returned to the crash site, searching for a link between the Columbia's arrival in the Gamma Quadrant and how other species could send their ships to the Alpha Quadrant. This species was known as the Borg. While a war had kicked off with the Borg Collective, Columbia and the fate of its crew played a vital role in helping end the Borg invasion of 2381. Indirectly, the actions of Captain Hernandez and the NX-02 created the Borg, and ended them. This was due to the Kelyar's involvement in moving their city ships. Still, that is a deeper story for a far different time. Following the war's end with the Borg, the Columbia was eventually, finally, returned to port in the Sol system, where she had originally been launched in 2154. The USS Da Vinci brought one of Earth's original starships home. Columbia underwent a systems repair to allow it to return to Earth under her own power. But did you know that in Star Trek Online's game story, its storyline in the Star Trek universe, the Columbia was actually refitted from its 22nd century specifications to the 23rd century Columbia class escort. It was then further outfitted with 25th century technology and returned to active duty. All of this was a result of the Iconian and temporal Cold Wars. The fate of the NX-02 Columbia is sad. Really sad. Tragically sad. Both for the crew and for the ship itself. It's also exciting, as if you read into it, you can find out how crucial the NX-02 was to moments in the Star Trek universe's history through books like the Destiny Trilogy. As we alluded to, due to the involvement of the Columbia crew and the Kelyar species, the Borg Collective ultimately were created and rose to power. This would bite everyone in the ass. Really, could we blame Starfleet for creating one of their worst enemies? It's somewhat poetic when you think about it. Even humanity in the present day is somewhat considered its own worst enemy. Still, perhaps one day we'll explore more of this story and tell you how Starfleet accidentally created the Borg. What do you think of the NX-02 Columbia, though, and her tragic fate? Personally, I wish we had seen more adventures in the early Starfleet days. But if you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, then hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. And you can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.